Hello. Can you all hear me? This is my first time presenting, um, as you can tell by how advanced my slides look. Um, so thank you very much for having me and letting me talk about my favorite subject in the world, which is community organizing. Um, like she said, uh, I've been in QA about five years, and I work for Keller Williams, which is the largest real estate company in America. Um, but I got into it in a really non-traditional path. And I think that's important because a lot of my other co-organizers on this meetup are coming from a non-traditional path. Um, and it really gives a sense of openness and acceptance um, when you're not coming necessarily from a hard science background, you don't have a lot of experts in your community, um, you have a mix of newcomers, experts, and people who are in between. I think that makes for a really valuable community. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna talk about my Meetup in particular. I've been part of Meetup communities since about, I joined, when I joined QA about five years ago. And uh, I'm gonna talk about this one because it is solely a QA Meetup. Um, and the way that we got started was, there was a Selenium-based Meetup in town. And I don't think Titus is here, so he's not gonna get mad at me for saying this. Uh, but they have on meetup.com a recurring event calendar where you can just click and set your meetups for however, want, however long in advance you want. And this particular Selenium group um, set the meetups in advance, and me and a couple of friends uh, were part of that, and they came to one of the meetups, and nobody was there, so there were no organizers. And uh, my friends decided, well, what are they gonna do in that situation? They don't wanna let it to die, <laughs> sorry, they don't wanna let it die, so they just decided to take it over. And that's the thing that happens on Meetup a lot of the time, is a community will lose organization leadership. Um, maybe someone will step down, get busy. Uh, a lot of people throw meetups out there and they don't necessarily follow through. So um, they'll have a great idea for a meetup, they'll put it on the website, and then there won't be enough organizers to really get it going. Or um, it'll get a certain maturity to it. Um, there'll be an ebb and a flow where the meetup will reach a certain stage of maturity and start declining. And that's what'll happen. Uh, Meetup will send out an email to everybody who's a member and you can just click on it and become an organizer. If you're wanting to start a Meetup, you don't necessarily have to start from scratch. Uh, I think that's my point is I, I wanna impress upon how many um, resources there are already out there. If you wanna start a community, there's a lot of people in tangential groups related to like dev and DevOps that might be willing to start a QA community with you, um, you can definitely partner with one of them and have an offshoot. So uh, that's one of my tips and tricks. <laughs> Sorry. And I wanna talk a little bit about reasons behind um, why community is important. So this, <laughs> I try to make this talk because it's called It's Dangerous to Go Alone. I try to make it all like Zelda oriented. I couldn't do it, it's been <laughs> probably 15 years since I played video games. I really tried that. Um, so my secret when I joined QA was I had imposter syndrome. And I didn't know that imposter syndrome was a very common thing. I hadn't been to a lot of these conferences and I hadn't heard all the talks on imposter syndrome yet. Um, around the same time, Brene Brown, which I think most people know in this room, but if not, she is a shame researcher. So she has a PhD. Um, researching shame, lives in Houston, Texas, and just writes books about shame, and gives great TED Talks, look it up on YouTube. And I think shame and imposter syndrome have a lot of things in common. They all have that core uh, start where you think you're maybe not good enough to be in a certain position, or you're going to be found out and called out for just doing what you should be doing. And one of the reasons I joined this meetup um, or I joined the meetups that I joined was, I was reading Brene Brown's work at the time, and she said that the antidote to shame, which I think is the antidote to imposter syndrome, was vulnerability and connection and empathy. Um, and I thought immediately, okay, I'm going about this the wrong way. Because when I joined QA, I was a manual tester. And I had some experience doing uh, networking, so I was able to set up a hardware lab, I was able to do database testing because I knew some SQL, but I didn't know anything about QA. Definitely didn't know anything about automation. And uh, not to give everyone my age, but I had not taken a programming class since COBOL. <laughs> so I uh, definitely felt really out of place. 
And Brene's Brown, uh, Brene Brown's antidote to shame, connection and vulnerability and empathy, I knew I couldn't get that at work. Um, when I was a little bit further in my career, I happened to join a company where the company culture was not one of openness. And I think we've all been here at some point. It's not a great place to be, but sometimes you just have to get through it. Um, and that was one where the company culture was kind of knowledge hoarding every person for themselves. You didn't want to admit that you didn't know anything. It could be used against you. And we all know this. We all know we can't be vulnerable with just everybody. Um, but we can't also necessarily be vulnerable at our jobs for either that reason or a variety of things. Maybe you're the only QA person at your job, and it's very common for managers even to not know what exactly it is that you do for a living. Um, maybe even your manager. <laughs> so um, my antidote to imposter syndrome as a result is community. Same thing as the antidote to shame. You need to get out from your laptops, and even though you're skilling up, and it's very important to skill up, if your imposter syndrome comes from an actual technical gap, you need to close that gap technically, technically, sorry. But you also need to address the feelings behind it, right? So imposter syndrome is really stressful to have to deal with when you're also trying to skill up. Um, meetups are a really great place to get that vulnerability and empathy and connection because it is exactly a place of voluntary participation. Everybody is there to learn. Everybody is there to grow. Um, if they're senior in their career, they're there to help and mentor. So uh, now that I've been in QA for a little bit longer, I have different reasons, right? Like sometimes QA loses its sparkle when uh, you've been fixing selenium tests and checking them in and they break and then you have to fix them again and check them in. Sometimes it gets a, a little hard to keep the motivation going, which is why we have conferences like this one right now. Um, we have great speakers at all of our meetups. Um, our speakers for tomorrow's meetup are going to be Angie Jones and Richard Bradshaw. So um, I really love our speakers. I really love the people there. Uh, I know when I talk to people in different roles in QA and different jobs, they all tell me that their coworkers, the people, are what makes them really love our job. And the people is why I love our meetup. Um, it's also really great for networking and hiring. Um, even though I say I love the people, and I do, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't leave my mind that I know a bunch of QA managers if I ever am in that position. Um, it doesn't hurt to have it on my LinkedIn. It doesn't hurt to have it on my resume. It definitely gives an idea of, okay, this person is going above and beyond. Um, same thing for socializing with like-minded people, uh, sense of belonging, getting quick answers to questions, having that expertise at your fingertips. When you know what people are working on and you have uh, a rapport with them, it's a lot easier than just posting on Stack Overflow. I don't know if you've posted on Stack Overflow and gotten just a snarky response. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's much better to have a Slack channel of your own community you can go to with that. Um, Seeing upcoming technological developments and being abreast of new trends is very important. You're not necessarily going to get that from work. Uh, just for an example, last week at work, somebody pointed out capture playback, and everybody else on my team responded, Selenium ID has been dead for years. It's never coming back. Um, <laughs> access to expertise. Uh, again, you can get practice presenting. That also doesn't look bad on a resume. You can have that as a start. You can join a lightning learning talk, which are only five minutes. Turn that into a conference uh, presentation. Submit it in calls for papers. And you can use that to apply for conferences all over the globe, if that's your goal. Um, strong professional identity. Uh, I think being part of this community really helps give me an identity. Um, one of the little stories I came across when I was researching ideas for this uh, presentation is there were two stone cutters outside a cathedral cutting bricks. And one person went up to the first stone cutter and said, what are you doing? And the first guy said, well, I'm cutting this brick into a shape. It's about a square. It's this many inches high and this many inches long. I'm going to put it on a truck. And then he went, this person went to the second stone cutter and said, what are you doing? And the second stone cutter said, I'm building a cathedral. So that's really the mentality that I have in these meetups. I'm building a cathedral. 
I'm doing um, whatever I can to have the big picture about QA that I might not necessarily get from my job. Um, let's see. Okay, <laughs> I found one more uh, Zelda image. Diversifying how you learn. So I'll give you a little bit story about my journey into becoming a QA person, or at least the automation person that I am now. Um, I started because I have like a Lisa Simpson mentality and I just want to be graded um, going back to college. And I'm still there. I actually left just a little bit to go take a class and come back. Um, so I started with college and I started with certifications because everybody says that the path, not everybody, but when I was interviewing, definitely everybody wanted certifications. And if you live somewhere like the UK, I hear they really, really want certifications. Um, so I took the ISTQB. Anyone else do that? <laughs> I won't say anything bad about it on stage. It's, it's a start. Um, and like my college classes and like the online classes you can get on Udemy and Coursera, um, they're valuable in that they teach you generic terminology, right? They give you a start. They help you learn how to talk to other people in your industry. But they're not going to skill you up very, very high. Um, same thing for uh, online classes, the free online classes, I found that they teach at a very generic level. You're probably not going to get a lot of best practices out of them. The Selenium ones in particular, um, I feel like they teach for someone who's never seen Selenium before, and as a result, they don't have, um, they don't necessarily have things like page object model. You won't learn um, SRP or dry or anything like that from most of these courses. Uh, they're getting a little better. Dave Hefner has a, has a great Selenium course out there. Andrew Krug is trying to put out an um, advanced Selenium course. But generally, you have to come to conferences like this to get the advanced Selenium. Um, and then the college courses that I'm taking, well, <laughs> um, they can tend to be a little bit out of date. Because you have to submit a um, proposal for a peer review to teach a class. And that class is going to be taught over several semesters. The professor is not going to wildly change his material from one semester to another. That's a lot of work. He's going to refine it over several iterations. So by the time you get to that class, it's already a little bit out of date. Um, it's probably not going to be exactly what you want. It'll help for things like data structures and algorithms. I definitely recommend classes for programming, but not necessarily yet for software testing and for things like that. Um, so how else are you going to learn? My point here is community is the solution. If I go to anyone with a lot of programming experience, I expect their answer to be, if I'm asking them, how, how am I going to learn this kind of stuff? Have a project or contribute to an open source project, which is the very definition of community. You can't really get more community than contributing to an open source project. So the idea I want to impress on you is, Communities of practice are actually a learning theory. It is a way to learn. Um, don't just consider them a meetup you go to because you want free pizza. Um, don't just go because you're bored. Really try to get out of it what you put into it. And I have this slide up because my best friend is a learning specialist at UT, University of Texas, Austin. So literally her PhD or master's right now that she's trying to get is on learning theory and she helps students find different ways of learning. So when I was researching this, I asked her for information. Is this a thing? Is this a learning theory? And she said, definitely it's a learning theory. And I got this book, um, not called Communities of Practice, but this is Etienne Wegner's definition of learning from community. She calls it Communities of Practice. Um, I think this is a great definition of who we are as a QA community right here. It's defined by knowledge rather than task. It exists because its participation has value to its members. It doesn't appear uh, the minute a project is started. It doesn't disappear with the end of a task. So our love of QA is not nine to five. It's not whenever we show up at this conference, it doesn't go away when we leave. We are basically a guild. Um, information in explicit ways is only a small part in knowing. So this is another idea of communities of practice. That information gathering is never going to be completely captured by an institutionalized process or by any type of formal learning. And what does that mean? Um, I basically said, 
defined it down to knowledge being tacit as well as explicit, and tacit knowledge often getting a little bit underrepresented. So tacit knowledge is a knowledge that we all have in our own heads that's really hard to codify necessarily. You may be an expert in your field, and you can write a book, you can write a blog, um, but that's not everything you know. There's a lot more to you than whatever you put down on paper. So if knowledge is tacit, how are we going to get that knowledge out of people if it's not explicit, if it's not written down and codified? Um, the answer is repeated interactions between individuals. And this is why diversity is important, because the more diverse your group of individuals that you're interacting with, with is, the better your ideas, the more diverse your ideas. And then institutionalized learning is static, communities of practice are dynamic. Um, that basically means that while you go to a class or you join a Coursera or a course or something like that, you'll be handed a syllabus and you'll only be taught what's in the syllabus. But a community of practice will change according to what its members want. It will grow, it will evolve. It will develop its own definitions and terminology. I think this is probably where the UI pyramid came into be. This is where we know terms like checking is not testing. Um, when we get enough people with tasks and knowledge together, it's called tribal knowledge, and it has value. So now that I've said, here's some reasons why you should value community, um, I want to give you some tips and tricks on organizing a community. Uh, these are what we've learned from putting together the Austin Automation Professionals, and we have grown from November 2017 to uh, this month, from maybe 300 members when we were that Selenium meetup, we kind of took their 300 members to about 1,200 right now. Uh, we have a very high RSVP turnout. We often get 60, 70 percent of our RSVPs. Um, we have 130 people signed up for tomorrow's meetup, and we usually get at least 60 people signed up for every meetup. So in terms of Austin, Texas, that's a big meetup. So my first. My first lesson, and this is more for everybody who wants to start a meetup, is my advice is do not put your meetup on the page or do not start a community until you have at least a topic or a place, time, and location. Um, and that is because it's very easy to start something, but it's really hard to follow through. And people know that. If you put up a meetup with almost no information on it, they're not going to take you seriously. So wait until you have that and then put your meetup. Even if all you have is, I know I want to get people together on this week, you can have a code and coffee, or you can have a happy hour. That way people know that they're probably going to pay for their own drinks. You don't need to go out and find a sponsor. And depending on the venue, you don't necessarily even need to call ahead. You can make it a very informal thing. Another thing we've learned is encourage people from the community to speak. And people have um, a lot of ideas about talks that they don't necessarily even know are talks. So as you talk to your members, you're going to get an ear for what actually sounds like a good talk, what sounds like a good workshop. It'll probably be just some throwaway line that they say, oh, I'm working on this, or it'll be a story. Um, we're a storytelling community, right? That's how we learned before, you know, written word, before anything else, we learned from stories. Um, and the point of communities as practice is storytelling, basically. So as people tell you those stories, try to spin that into, you know, that would be a great intro. That you, that's great that you learned this from that experience. Can you come give a talk on it? Can you give a lightning learning five-minute talk on it? Um, that sounds like a really good demo. That sounds like a really good workshop. Location is super important. Um, I live in South Austin. Our meetups are in North Austin. North Austin is where the big businesses are. We get a higher turnout there. Um, so it's worth it to go a little bit out of your way to go to where your, made up, your members are going to be. Um, but every once in a while, have something informal, have something smaller on the other side of town, because that way you'll have a very high percentage of newcomers at that other meetup that you can roll into your larger meetup. Um, we always have 20, 30 minutes of networking before the event. People just got off work. They're tired. They're hangry. Um, and that's why I also said, have hot pizza, have cold beer, have, <laughs> make sure they're both you know, hot and cold. Um, have vegetarian options. They're going to want food, and it makes a huge difference in your turnout if you have food. Um, consistency is super key. It, this may be one of my um, biggest 
points and why we're such a, a consistently large meetup is because we always select the same time about the same location, um, the same day of the week, and the same week of the month. That way it becomes habit forming. You want your meetups to be habit forming. Make it a pattern. Um, have fillers so there's always something on meetup. So, um, and regardless of what site you're using, always have something coming up in upcoming events. Try not to have TBD. I'm not always the best at this, but even if there are no um, large talks coming up in the next month, try to have something small. You can even have a social. You can have a hike and bike or whatever, just to have something on Meetup to keep it in their mind. Um, and then email your members too. When there's a large Meetup coming up, send them a reminder email. Get it habit forming. Sorry that this is just a giant list. I, I'm not sure how else to present it other than a list when it's a series of tips and tricks. Um, I will say, please have backup demos. Um, things happen. Presenters cancel. Family emergencies happen. We had our venue change this meetup. Uh, be prepared for those kind of things. Back up your presentation on a thumb drive. Uh, have extra computers. Make sure your AV equipment is working. Make sure that there's somebody at the door. Um, make sure that you put up a sign if the door is locked with someone's phone number on it. Think of all these things beforehand and have yourself a list. Like I went camping this weekend and I have a camping list of everything to bring so I never forget sunscreen in Texas again. Um, do something similar to that. Having co-organizers has been super critical. I, I started this meetup, or I didn't start this meetup, but I joined this meetup when we had a you know, few organizers. Um, one of my, a few of my friends, uh, Javier, Joel, um, Evan, we're about four people, and I think we're up to like six or seven now. I've noticed that the larger the number of uh, leadership team members are, the more stable the um, sorry, the more stable your meetup is going to be. Definitely, the ones with about five or six um, people in the organizational team are the ones that I see um, go on for years and have very good turnout. Things, and this goes back to things happen, people get sick, people have to fall back every once in a while. You're gonna need people to stand up and help you when you have things happen in your life. Uh, don't be the presenter every time. This does happen sometimes. I do go to meetups where the person who put out that meetup is the same person who is speaking, and then the next time the same thing happens. It starts to look a little bit like you're selling something at that point, so you're gonna wanna rotate. Um, Get sponsors, this is crucial. Uh, we've definitely relied on our sponsors uh, to provide food because obviously I can't cater for 50 people every month, but for a lot of companies, like our sponsor is uh, Andrew Fraser, which is a recruiting firm, Austin Fraser, and they have a budget, obviously, because they are hiring QA people, and we have had a lot of people get hired through them. So their budget is a drop in the hat because they're gonna get that money back. Um, talk to people, talk to your own company. They usually have either a diversity budget that they can pull from or a recruiting budget, and they will help you find things like venues. They have a lot of connections. So find a champion, you're gonna need a champion. Um, respond quickly to questions. Meetup has a email feature. Um, we also have a Slack channel when people ask questions, like on our Slack channel, sometimes it's something nobody knows the answer to. And this is something I wrote down because I had a particular issue with it. Uh, I wasn't responding to those people when I didn't know the answer to their question. And then I realized it made me look kind of like a jerk. Because they don't know that you're not responding because you don't know. They have no idea. They think maybe you know, you're introverted or not friendly or it could be any number of reasons. So just respond to the question even if it's just, I don't know. Um, solicit feedback from the community. A lot of meetups have a link to a survey on them. You definitely informally poll people, to ask what's working, what's not working. Code of conduct is super important, um, and that's related to the last bit about be able to have uncomfortable conversations. Um, I've had this as a woman. You all know what I'm talking about. Uh, but in general, you can have uncomfortable conversations about anything. Say someone joins QA and they don't realize how intensive 
it is in Austin as um, an automation town. Like Austin is super big on automation and everybody wants you to learn how to code and maybe they think that they don't have to necessarily learn how to code or they don't need to learn about CI, CD or they don't need to learn about APIs. Um, that's kind of unrealistic. So the people will come up to you from all sorts of backgrounds. You need to be kind and polite to them, obviously. And you might be tested a little bit if you're an introvert and you're not used to talking to a lot of people. Um, some people have been looking for a job a long time. Sometimes uh, someone just really wants to vent. Um, you need to be able to have those kind of conversations and grow as a, as a person uh, socially. I say with my voice wavering. <laughs> Uh, don't have your meetup be on a single framework or tool. Uh, these, are, these are my don'ts, and I've seen this a lot in Austin. Um, there will be meetups on one single framework, uh, for instance, the Selenium meetup. Well, if a competitor to Selenium comes up and replaces them, now you're going to have to change your whole meetup. And then if another competitor comes up, you're going to have to change that meetup. So try to make it broad enough where you can attract a wide variety of visitors. Um, and new members and, and new people, but not so narrow um, that even though it'll maybe be a good technical presentation, you might have a really low turnout. Try to hit the sweet spot in the middle of having a lot of things like networking events and socials for people who are new to QA and maybe aren't that technical, and then have some deep technical demos, uh, but try to not have just one or the other. Um, don't start a meetup, and I have definitely done this, uh, don't start anything out of feeling like, you know, you should do this. I need to do this for my career. Don't do it out of a, a sense of people pleasing. Um, I did this for an AT&T meetup. We organized golf trips with like the women in Boston. I absolutely hate golf. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> and I wasn't a very good leader as a result. Um, so if you're not a social person who likes talking to a whole bunch of people, um, if you don't have a whole lot of time to organize, just step out of the way and let other people take that role. Um, we have a very definitive, I can't say the word, but I'm going to say jerk here, no jerk policy. Um, we don't really want our meetup to turn into a clique. It, it's not good to have a meetup where everybody is just showing off. If you start getting that idea, um, you need to scale back. You need to bring in new blood. Um, don't, don't let it get into people's head that this is their meetup. The meetup is the people in the meetup, not the organizer of the meetup. You need to let that meetup grow in ways that is dynamic. Um, and this is a small, slight one, but you know, obviously when you're demoing, don't share without approval. Um, so I'm going to give you some ideas of meetups if you want to get started and you just have no idea how. Um, so one way you can promote your meetup is obviously any social media channel you're already a part of. We use LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all of them basically. Instagram at one of my meetups. Um, you can have swag or raffle days where you raffle off. You know, someone raffled off an IntelliJ uh, license to me and a T-shirt last week, PHP conference. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, you can always have an accompanying blog or a recording. Launch Darkly has a great meetup site where they also record their meetups. They have a little blurb about it. Um, have some sort of mission statement. At least have a description on your meetup page. Try to have a general direction that you're going in. You don't need to have everything lined up completely in the beginning. You can start without having that completely nailed down, but at least have an elevator pitch. Um, so yeah, here's some things you can throw out there if you need, uh, if you need to get going. So you can have a lean coffee, uh, pick a topic, have a bunch of no card, like different uh, colored sticky notes in the middle of a table, bring up that topic and have people uh, do a lean coffee on it. Uh, you can have a code and coffee, either formal or informal, pick a project and work on it, obviously happy hour. Uh, we had a book club, I'm gonna bring it back. Um, that's just a generic book club. We meet, we talk about a QA-related book. Pay Talks is a great one. Um, the Austin DevOps has a pay talk where everybody submits their salary on 
uh, Excel spreadsheet, and you know, obviously they hide the information, um, but then they correlate all the data at the end, and they have this talk where they go over what everyone put down as their salary in Austin. It's super enlightening. I was not aware of the salary difference I had between me and other people in my industry until that pay talk. We also have a thing we call State of the Union every January, where we talk about, you know, here's the state of hiring and here's a state of QA as it pertains to our city. So in our city, these are the most popular coding languages. Um, these are the most popular skill sets. This is what people are looking for. You might want to get into like security is a big one this year. Uh, lightning talks are always popular. Workshops, um, scholarship drives. This list, not as popular lately, but I think it would be great to send somebody to college from like a meetup community. I've seen people do it. Online meetups, Ministry of Testing, is a really, really wonderful community. If you're not already a part of it, please go check it out. Um, social's great. Um, and speaking of Ministry of Testing, London has a bouldering social, like just QA bouldering. And I really want that here, because we have three bouldering gyms. But you can have it basically on whatever you want. Um, you can also combine with other meetups. So uh, there's hundreds of meetups in the Austin, Texas area. Um, if you don't necessarily have an idea for a meetup, you can join an existing meetup, and that way you get double the members for the same price, basically. Um, you can ask them what they're working on, and you can join forces. Uh, Boston actually does a really great example of collaborating with other meetups. They have a Slack channel that is for every single Boston meetup that was willing to join in. And they all talk to each other and say, hey, what's going on in your meetup this week? We need someone for this. Will you help me with that? Um, if you haven't considered anything like that, maybe um, you can start that. So 2.16 to go. Uh, talk a little bit fast when I'm nervous. But thank you all. Uh, our link to our website is on the screen. And you can come to it tomorrow. We'll be at Kasasa. It's a little bit of a drive. Um, but we have great presenters. We have a lot of RSVPs. And I hope that my talk has given you some motivation to um, either join a community, start a community, or um, encouragement on why community is important. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe a question, if anyone has any. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hi, yes, yeah, so I am an occasional attendee of the Austin Automation Professionals Meetup, and it's a great meetup, so thank you for putting that together. Awesome. Um, I, my question is, I guess one of, the, um, one of the things I most enjoy about that meetup and, and a couple of the other meetups I go to is when um, people from the community uh, come up and present basically just what they're working on. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting to see like what solutions people come up with, but I suspect there's probably a lot of people um, considering that you know we're engineers that are probably a little nervous to do that, and there may, so there may not be as many of those as as there possibly could be because you know people are you know recalcitrant maybe to do a presentation. Right. How, how do you do you find that that's the case, and if so, how do you encourage people to sort of come out of the woodwork and get up there and put themselves out there and do a presentation? Yeah, people have great ideas all the time, and sometimes they just haven't linked it to a presentation, and sometimes they're nervous, obviously, about presenting. But I think our meetup is a small enough community that you can just remind them that this is a community of your friends. Um, the more entrenched they are in the community, they know that they're not going to be necessarily judged. Um, I think, like, I forgot an example, but uh, my friend Evelyn, I was just speaking to about an hour ago, had a great idea, and uh, she's probably going to watch this on YouTube, and I'm talking about her. But she had a great idea while I was talking about imposter syndrome. She was saying we should have an imposter syndrome court where I come to my house, like I'm at my house, I have a fake judge's robe and like a wig, and people come to me and say, I suck at automation. And I'd say, no, you don't, I'm the judge. <laughs> Here's why you don't. Um, so like, that's just one example, but people will give you little gems all the time, you just have to be listening to them. Thank you. Awesome, I think we're at time, so. Okay. Uh, Thank you again, Julie. If you have any other questions, she'll be around, so um, go find her in the hallway track. Um, let's give her one more round of applause.